everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our May History Talks and welcome to the folks joining us over Zoom. Uh, for those of you here tonight, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to sign in so that we can get an accurate count of attendance. Um, and you can do that after the talk. You can also use that form to sign up for our newsletter. My name is Felicia, and I am the museum coordinator for the Lacey Museum. And for tonight's program, we are joined by Lester Dixon. Tonight, he'll be sharing the evolution of Prince Hall Freemasons from circa 1770s to present day. This presentation will discuss the challenges the organization overcame, the notable members of the order, its introduction in the state of Washington, and it, its expansion uh, to the city of Lacey. So before we begin, I would like to start our program with a land acknowledgement, and then we'll go into some museum news. The Lacey Museum is on the ancestral land of the tribal people of the Treaty of Medicine Creek, including the Nisqually Indian Tribe and Squaxin Island Tribe. We acknowledge and remember those tribal people not recognized today who were absorbed or relocated into other tribes for survival. We recognize the ancestors and their descendants who are still here. We recognize and respect the tribal people of the Treaty of Medicine Creek as the traditional stewards of this land since time immemorial and their role today in taking care of these lands in perpetuity. We recognize and have the responsibility to call attention to the histories of dispossession, forced removal, and abridged treaty rights that allowed our nation, state, and city to develop as they have today. We recommend that community members read the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854. Okay. okay. As always, we would love to see you at the museum. If you stop by, we are open Thursdays and Fridays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 4. You will see myself and Olivia there and some of our wonderful volunteers. Come view our Smithsonian poster exhibit called Journey Stories. This exhibit explores how movement has shaped our nation with a look at American expansion and migration from the earliest settlers and Native American displacement to the effects of transportation on modern mobility. We are selling Thurston County Historical Journals after the com completion of tonight's program. If you are interested in those, they will be available on the back table and we can take hard or cash payment. And they are also available at the museum if you stop by. So this is our last history talk of the 2023-2024 season, but we will be back for our next season starting September 2024. We are taking a summer break, um, but we all hope to see you next season. And while we are on break, we are hosting different, different craft activities at the museum um, each month over the summer. So our June craft is lavender. Uh, these crafts and activities are free for uh, everyone and for all ages, so grownups too. Okay, so for tonight's presentation, we will hold our Q&A section at the end. We will do our best to get questions from our in-person and online attendees. So for those online, if you have any questions you think of during the presentation, feel free to submit them in the Q&A button on your screen. It's usually located at the bottom. Um, and for those in-person, I will be coming around with a microphone if you have a question. Um, so just raise your hand. We use that microphone because folks at home can't hear your question if you have them and we don't use the microphone. Um, okay, so for tonight's speaker, um, I would like to introduce Lester Dixon. Lester Lee Dixon is a 30-year resident of the city of Lacey and has 27 years of public service with the state of Washington. He has spent 42 years as a Prince Hall Freemason. A few notable positions include Worshipful Master of Fred U. Harris Lodge, number 70, Grand Master of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge, State of Washington and Jurisdiction. Commander in Chief, Capital City Consistory, number 106, and a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason. He is a current board member of the Dr. James W. Washington Foundation for the Arts and member of the Social Justice and Civic Engagement Committee, United Supreme Council, Northern Jurisdiction. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good evening to all. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the staff of the City of Lacey uh, uh, Museum for this opportunity to present this evening program on Prince Hall Masons and Washington State. I welcome all of you who are in attendance 
and those online. And I say thank you for your attendance. And hopefully, you'll, if you don't know anything about Freemasons, you will walk away learning something a little bit about us. I have uh, up to about 45 minutes to present. That's only just a smidgen of what's to know about Freemasons. I'm sure some of you may already know a little bit about it. You may have traveled uh, around. You may see some of the Masonic signs, uh, and you'll see some of that on a uh, on some of the slides that I uh, showed show tonight. And you, you would see some of those on some of the buildings and cars and people that have. So tonight, we will go through this program and hopefully, as I said, you'll learn something from it. Okay, now throughout this presentation, I will use terms such as black, Negro, colored, and African American. I'll use those interchangeably. Due to the wording used, during the research uh, sources that I use for this presentation. So, let us begin. All right, let me move this up just a bit. Now, I'm sure most of you can read, but <laughs> let, me, let me go through this with you. Uh, during this presentation, we will travel back in time and explore the world of Prince Hall Freemason, who they are, their mark in, in history, their beginning in Washington State, and their struggle to become recognized as a legitimate body. Now, to start, as, as, as uh, the philosopher Lao Zeus from the sixth century would say, a journey of a thousand miles began with a single step. So let us begin with the first step. The beginning. We will discuss Freemasonry, what it is, the origin of Freemason, the establishment of the first Grand Lodge. That's not necessarily in Washington State. Then we'll talk about Prince Hall, the man, and then Prince Hall, the organization. And when we speak about the organization, we'll discuss the founding and early years, the growth and leadership, the legacy and empowerment. We will cover Prince Hall Masons and Washington State, which is the gist of our conversation tonight, how Prince Hall Mason arrived in Washington State. We will talk about the, for the formation of Prince Hall Lodges, the founding of Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Washington, the recognition of Prince Hall Freemasons, and then, of course, the lodge from which I am a member, Fred U. Harris Lodge Number 70. I also see another member of Fred U. Harris Lodge Number 70, Hank Shiga, and his lovely <laughs> wife, Paula. Thank you for, for being here, and, and again, thank you for all, all of you. Now, then we will also cover Freemasons, Prince Hall Mason. A lot of these names I'm sure you will recognize once we get to them. All right. Let the show begin. <laughs> okay, what is Freemasonry? It's one of the oldest and largest non religious, non religious, non political, and fraternal and charitable organization. Because its core principle involves self-knowledgement, self-knowledge through participation through progressive ceremony, emphasizing moral and spiritual values. That's important because it, we, we emphasize taking a good man and making him better by providing these types of tools for them. Uh, Freemason is deeply involved in philanthropic and charitable endeavors, individual participation contribute to advancement within the organization. So the more you do contributing to the, to, to the to a community, charitable giving helps you in your growth within the organization. The, the uh, leadership recognizes you and promotes you up in the organization as you go forward. That's, that's, uh, that's required. And we also support, of course, local sports, scholarships, civic programs, events, and activities. Now, here's, here's something that 
So one may wonder. Masons refer to each other as brothers because of the belief in equity. Now, as we go through this program, we will see that might not have always been true between black and white Masons. But we've, we've grown past that in Washington State. And we'll talk about some of those states we have not passed that yet. <laughs> OK. Now, the origin of Freemasonry. Now, one would think Masons, stonemasons, right? One who make, makes with stones, works with stone. Well, originally, that's what Freemasons were. They were stonemasons. They formed themselves into a group and called themselves a group of stonemasons. So history has it uh, that they uh, developed from, from organized body of operative stonemasons to the modern system of speculative masons, okay, organized around regional or national grand lodges. Now, I've never worked in stone, but I am a Freemason, so I'm part of the speculative masons. Okay? Uh, the first emergence of organized lodges of operative stone masons occurred during the Middle Ages, you know, during the buildings of all of the great castles and, and, and temples, etc., uh, 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 pyramids, etc., you know, all of the great stone masons. They traveled around to, to build those type of, type of structures. Uh, then later, the lodges evolved to allow the admission of lay members as accepted so you will see the word free and accepted masons, which means they have been accepted into the Masonic order as, as, as masons, although they are not stone masons. They're speculative masons. Okay? And finally, the evolution of purely speculative lodges and the emergence of grand lodges to govern them. Now, I'm in a black suit, pretty warm. <laughs> But this is normally our uniform for the Prince Hall Masons. It's a black suit. So uh, some of you may have noticed that. Uh, if, if you've seen any Prince Hall Mason or been to any of our ceremonies to include when we, when, when we uh, uh, do ceremonies to, to bury our dead, who, members who have died within our organization. OK. The first Masonic Grand Lodge was established in 1717 in London, England. <laughs> we have a person, uh, who, a member of the uh, museum who is from, from England, and I was just speaking to her and listening to her, 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 uh, her dialect and noticed, ah, so I think you're not from, from uh, America originally. And she said, no, I'm from England. I didn't want to tell her that I'm going to speak about England here in a moment. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so, there were four existing lodges convened and, con and constituted themselves as the first Masonic Grand Lodge, known at that time as the Premier Grand Lodge of, of England. Today, it is now recognized as the United Grand Lodge of England and serve as the governing body of Freemasonry. The four original lodges were, now get this, Goose and Gridiron Ale House. <laughs> okay? Now called Lodge of Antiquity Number no. Two, Crown Ale House. A lot of drinking going on. <laughs> and Parker's Lane, Apple Tree Tavern. <laughs> now called Lodge of Forty Two and Old Cumberland, Number no. Twelve, <laughs> and Rumor and Grapes. <laughs> How about that? It's still a tavern. <laughs> now called Royal Somerset House and Inverness Lodge Number no. Four, because you know during the, that time period, ladies were not in, in, uh, invited to to those ale houses or, or taverns. I'm sure it was a group of men, and and so they, they constituted themselves to become a lodge, and and I guess they they. They uh, reformed themselves to being from, from drinkers to doers and, and their civic activities. OK. <clears throat> so the establishment of this first Grand Lodge marked a significant moment in the history of Freemasonry. 
shaping its principles and practices for centuries to come. That's the emblem of it, speaking of. The square and the compass and the letter G. G meaning geometry, because you know, that's what you use when you're building using, using stone geometry. Of course, the, 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 the compass to, to circumscribe you know, circles and the, and, and, and the square to, to square off blocks, OK? So, so you, I'm, I'm sure you often see that on cars. And, and there's, in, in Tumwater, there's a, there's a large hall there, and they have their big emblem out there on, on top of that. So I'm sure you're familiar with that. Now, let's talk about Prince Hall, the man and the organization. But first, we'll start with the man. That's a depiction of Prince Hall. Born at Bridgetown, Barbados, in the British West Indies. Now it says, except the date, what I meant by that is his birth date. Except the date, during that time, a lot of records were not kept very well, especially for people of color. You know, so that's, that's other research have had him born a little earlier. But, but, the, but most have, have said around this time frame, September 12, 1748. Uh, he was described to be short in statue, five feet three. So that's his, that's his height, fair complexion, slight of build. Now I thought this was interesting, shapely head. <laughs> so now how would you describe a person using shapely head? <laughs> What? Yeah, that was a square. <laughs> That's right. Egg shape. Ah, uh, well, I guess. Okay. Features. Features refined and regular. And eyes bright and piercing. <laughs> All right. And you see African lodges wearing a Masonic apron and a collar. Okay. Prince Hall the man. Let's continue with him. His father, Thomas. Prince Hall, an Englishman, <laughs> and a leather worker by trade, and his mother is described as a free colored woman of French extraction. Okay. He arrived in Boston in March 1765 of free parentage. What does that mean? Free born. Why is that important? Because in masonry, to be a mason, you have to be free born. We mean you must not have been born into slavery. Okay? So that's why we mean by free and accepted Masons. Okay? So that was important, particularly later on when he was challenged about whether or not he was a Mason. Because as well, it was assumed perhaps that, that both men, the black men, were, were, were slaves. That was not true in America, not true in during the colonial time. There were a lot of free black men and black, black women at that time. They just were, were remained separated from those who were enslaved in order to keep that distance and to keep them from the slave from, from thinking about freedom. Yeah. So there were a lot of free black people in America at that time. OK, he had two wives. Sarah Richery, who died in 1769, and Phoebe Baker, whom he married in 1784. He's considered to be a man of natural qualities and superior educational attainment with strong religious belief, which make him a leader among the colored men in, in Masonry in Boston at that time. At the start of the Revolutionary War in 1775, Prince Hall and members of his lodge conferred with General George Washington concerning the enlistment of colored men. There was a lot of opposition to that originally. But they managed to convince him. And as a result, 5,000 free men of color were enlisted in the war. However, considering the climate of the time, after the war, after they used us up, <laughs> they, a decree was rescinded. Uh, the decree was rescinded by the Continental Congress, unfortunately. 
Then in 1796, Prince Hall founded the first school for, for colored youth in Massachusetts, modeled after the school in Philadelphia. And he died in 1807. However, it was not until June 25th, 1895, when a monument emblematic of, of the Masonic teaching was unveiled over his grave quite a number of years later. OK, now let's talk about Prince Hall, the organization. Founded in early years. 1775, Prince Hall and 14, took 15 of them all together to, to form a lodge. Uh, we're made Mason and Lodge number 441, and it was under the Irish Registry, under the uh, 38th British Foot in, in, uh, Infantry at Castle William Island in Boston Harbor, Massachusetts. That was the first time black men were made Masons and, and, uh, and the colonies. Afterwards, when the, when the British uh, foot infantry left Boston, of course, you know what happened in, in, at, during that time frame? The Revolutionary War. So out the British. Uh, uh, so Prince Hall and his associate were left without a lot. They were made Mason, but the British left them with a permit but only to, to bury their dead and, and to meet as a lot. Only those, those 14, 15 members. That's it, they couldn't make any more Masons because they did not have a permit to do that. You have to have a charter to do that and it had to be uh, 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 authorized from a, from, from a, a body, an organized body to allow you to, 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 uh, to have a charter to do so. And we'll get to that point. So in 1776, African Lodge Number no. 1 was, was organized after the British left, and he had just a lodge. Uh, he was his first, and he was the first worshipful master. Uh, he received uh, a permit uh, to be a pro from provincial, provincial Grand Master John Rowe to walk in, in processions on St. John's Day and St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, who are patrons and the Masonic Order. And we still recognize those patrons today, and we celebrate those, those patrons uh, on, on uh, special occasions. And then in 1784, African Lodge Number no. 1 petitioned the Grand Lodge of England for a warrant or a charter to organize a regular Masonic Lodge and the Grand Lodge of England granted the charter and renumbered to be African Lodge number 459. Now, why did it move from number one to 459? Well, now it's under the Grand Lodge of England, who had other lodges, so they go by sequential numbers. So they became 459, making it the first lodge of black masons in America. OK, now we continue with Prince Hall, the organization. Under growth and leadership, African Lodge number 459 thrive, and the Prince Hall was appointed as provincial grandmaster in 1791. Okay, and this led to the first pro provincial Grand Lodge. Prince Hall went on to organize lodges in Philadelphia and Rhode Island, both, both working under the charter of the African Lodge number 459. And then in 1808, after Prince Hall passing, passing African Lodge number 459 for Boston, then African Lodge number 459, Philadelphia, and Hiram Lodge number three, Providence, became the African Grand Lodge, also known as African Grand Lodge number one. Because now they had their own charter and start their own numbers, okay? Thank you, Grand Lodge of England. <laughs> All right. In 1847, they renamed themselves the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in honor of their founding father that continues to be used today. Okay, And you will see those, that, that uh, naming come up in, in this presentation again. Uh, 
and, and uh, the Grand Lodge of the United Grand Lodge of England uh, often uh, meet, and we also uh, often go over to meet with them and convene with them and have have uh, communication with the United Grand Lodge of England to this day. Okay, legacy and empowerment. Prince Hall and other black free black uh, Masonic leaders, including Moses Dixon. I had to include that name. <laughs> it makes me wonder, well, is that my great, great, great grandfather? I have to, you know, what is that? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 geology uh, check uh, and see if, if, if that com comes up or bear any truth to that. If so, hey, I have a legacy to follow. <laughs> anyway, Lewis Hayden also was, was a key players, and they were also abolitionists and civil rights movements of the 19th century. They were leaders in that, and that's what, uh, what Prince Hall would, would advocate during his lifetime. Freedom, abolitionists, uh, and, and, and freedom for, uh, for, for the enslaved people. Okay. So, consequently, Freemasonry became a, va a, a vulnerable for the uh, vulnerable black community under their leadership, it became a very important part of, of the black community because of that. They didn't have a lot of black organization, so Freemasonry, Prince Hall Freemasonry, was it. And we spoke about the values, you know, the spiritual values, the moral values that it teaches. Mm -hmm. Okay, his advocacy extends beyond Masonry. He petitioned the Massachusetts government for the abolition of slavery and the slave trade. Unfortunately, he was not successful in that. As you well know, it happened in 1865 under the Emancipation Proclamation under Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's another story in itself. <laughs> okay, uh, the, the tradition uh, initiated by Prince Hall endures with approximately 5,000 lodges and 47 Grand Lodges. So there are 47 Grand Lodges. Each state has its own Grand Lodge. Okay, so Washington is sovereign within itself. Okay. Now, not all states have a Prince Hall Grand Lodge. Some of those are like uh, Liberia, uh, Canada, where a Prince Hall Grand Lodge e exists. Uh, uh, Barbados, uh, the Bahamas as well, where a Prince Hall Grand Lodge exists. So 47 Grand Lodges. So that doesn't speak to how many Prince Hall Masons there are individually, but 47 Grand Lodges. Uh, so they all can trace themselves back to Massachusetts. Now we get to the topic, the reason why we were we started this conversation about Prince Hall Masons in Washington State. Now we're here at home. wasn't Wasn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? We were just talking earlier about how beautiful the mountain is when when when, when it's clouded over and then the, and then the clouds break and you see that mountain appear. That's one reason why I live here. See that beautiful mountain, that natural beauty. Anyway, moving <laughs> forward. <laughs> okay, Prince Hall Masons in Washington State. Okay, the first Grand Lodge in Washington State Territory, because Washington was a territory before, it, because you know, it was under Oregon and it became Washington Territory. That's another history in itself. <laughs> uh, and it was the Grand Lodge of Washington, which still exists today. Uh, it was established in 1858. 31 years before Washington, Washington became a state. At that time, no Grand Lodge of colored men existed in the territory at the time. However, there were two Grand Lodges that established lodges here from other states. Let's see who they were. The most wishful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Illinois. There's no noise in Illinois. <laughs> Organized May 8, 1867, and established four lodges. Some of you might recognize some of these locations. We had Enterprise Lodge number 47. Now you see AF and AM. 
ancient, free, and accepted Masons. Later on, you will see F and AM, free and accepted Masons. There's a slight difference there. H and free refers back to the, to the stone Masons time and, and on, on, under those operative Masons. And then when they organized to become a, 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 a um, grand body, uh, uh, later it became a modern Freemason, then they dropped the ancient and became free and accepted Masons. Okay. Uh, then Washington Lodge number four nine out of Franklin, Washington. It moved later moved to Seattle. Inland Empire still exists today. Out of Spokane, Washington, and it started in 1901. Encompass Lodge located in Everett, Washington. Mm, and I didn't put a date there. Oh well. Let's say it's during that era. <laughs> All right, and the other one was uh, the Grand Lodge of Iowa. The most forceful uh, harem Grand Lodge of Iowa, uh, and it was organized in 1884, now known as the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Iowa. And we have Cascade Lodge number 23, chartered in 1897 in Roslyn as the first African lodge. Now, how many of you know about Roslyn? How many, how many of you know about Roslyn? Oh, yeah, well, some of you know about Rosalind. Well, for those, who, those of you who don't, uh, it was founded in 1886 as a coal mining town. Uh, of course, now it's changed its economy to be a forest, forestry and tourism. Uh, now, Rosalind is unique. It has 26 separate cemeteries. that is combined into one big complex. Why? Because of many ethnic groups that came to, be, to, to mine the coal, the Russians, the, you know, the, uh, a lot of people from, 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 from Europe. Uh, uh, during the 1888, there was a, a, a strike, and, and, they, and the owners of the coal mine brought in black workers to be strike uh, breakers, and so a lot of a lot of blacks start moving in and become, uh, and, and they brought their families with them, so they moved in. Uh, but because of the racial breakup at the time and the racial climate, when when they passed away, they buried them in separate cemeteries, all combined in one big complex. So you know all about it. Uh, uh, myself, Henry Shigai, we, uh, my grand lodge, we used to go up there and, and, and clean up the part where the, where the black uh, masons were, were, were buried because they had, not only were they ethnic groups, they had uh, uh, separate religious groups, uh, Masonic groups. So everybody, every group had their own cemetery. <laughs> so I understand that that's one of the unique uh, cemeteries in the world, in the world right there in Roslyn. Now, Roslyn population uh, in 2020 was around 1,000 people. <laughs> OK? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most of them are in the cemetery. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> now, what, what I did find, uh, it was also added to the National Registry of Historic Places in 1978. How about that? But I also found that there were three movies filmed there. The Running, The Runner Stumbles. Most of you probably know this one. Northern Exposure. Oh, yeah. oh yes. <laughs> and The Man in the High Castle was filmed there. I guess, the, the, in fact, when they speak of uh, a tourism, that's, the, that's where uh, they go to that little cafe where a lot of those scenes were were, were filmed, so a lot of people come to visit that little cafe up in Roslyn. Okay, so that's Roslyn. Okay, so we had the first African lodge there. Okay, because of the, the congregation of, of a lot of blacks at that time, and, and it being a coal mining town, and coal, of course, was the gold of the time, right? It was the gold of the time. Okay, and then we had Trinity Lodge, a charter in 1903 in Seattle. And then Guiding Star Lodge, number 31, Ancient Free and Accepted Masons, chartered in 1905 in North Yakima. Okay, now 
we'll go to the establishment of Prince Hall Grand Lodge in Washington State. 1903, members of the, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, lodges in, in, of uh, Illinois, that includes the Enterprise Lodge, all of those others that were mentioned before, Inland Empire, uh, assembled and, and established the first Grand Lodge for black men known as the Grand Lodge of Washington and Oregon, ancient, free, and accepted Masons, the two. Remember, Oregon and Washington State, although by this time, uh, Washington was a state in itself, but they were still co-mingling back and forth uh, uh, as Masons. Okay. Then in 1906, the Grand Lodge was incorporated under the, the new name, Grand, uh, the new name of Grand Lodge Free and Accepted Masons, African of Washington. They have Oregon to fend for, for themselves. They have their own Grand Lodge down there as well. In 1907, at a meeting in the city of, of Tacoma, the name was retitled to Most Worshipful United Grand Lodge, Grand Lodge of Washington and Jurisdiction. Now you see where the A is gone, free and accepted Masons, and embraced the three lodges under the jurisdiction of Iowa, because Iowa was still out there. First it was Illinois that gathered and became the Grand Lodge. Iowa was still out there, but because they couldn't communicate with their Grand Lodge in Iowa as quick as they could, wanted to, they decided to join in with, with uh, Washington. So they incorporated the Iowa, uh, Iowa Lodges. Okay, and then in 1944, in the city of Seattle, they passed a resolution to rename it Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge Free and Accepted Masons Masons of Washington and jurisdiction. Now, why do we use jurisdiction? I'll tell you about that in a moment. Hold on. <laughs> and where it remains to this day. Okay. All right. Prince Hall Grand Lodge continued. Today, the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge has approximately 2,000 members in 48 lodges spread out among three continents. North America, Asia, and Europe. That's Washington alone. That's why we say jurisdiction. Washington and jurisdiction, because we're also in, in other parts of the world. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, okay. Approximately 23 lodges are within the, lodge, within the borders of Washington State, while the remaining are in foreign countries. Countries include British Columbia, uh, Canada. Germany, England, mainland Japan, Okinawa, Japan, the Philippines, Guam, and the United Arab Emirates. That's just a few. There was a few more. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see by the next statement, that's, that's why uh, I said jurisdiction. Because Washington have a, it's a military type of, uh, state. You got Air Force, Army, Navy. So when they, when they become Masons, when the state of Washington, they want to continue their Masonic travels. They, wherever they may, may travel, there may not be a lodge for them to continue their Masonic work. So they ask for a charter. Since they're from Washington, we grant them a charter wherever they may have been uh, uh, a station and they establish this lodge. So some of them lodges go back to, 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 to 1940, 1960, when they were you know, do, doing some of those uh, wars, uh, during the Philippine War, et cetera. So a lot of soldiers are out there. So, we, so Washington Grand Lodge chartered many lodges throughout those, those various countries. And of course, we want one in, in England because where did we get our charter to start in the first place? England, okay. Uh, United Arab Emirates, that's new. I think we just started that not too long ago. That's in Dubai. <laughs> wow, I'd like to go out there one day, but it's, it's expensive. As Grand Master, which I served as Grand Master, you have to travel to a lot of those places. 
but but when we travel overseas to visit them, when we go to Europe, then they come to one place. We didn't go to all of those different places. There may be different lodging in those different places, and some of them we couldn't visit anyway because of the because of the maybe uh, uh, like uh, for instance we had one in in, uh, in the uh, uh, in the war zone area, so we couldn't go there. So they would come and 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 and, and convene in one one spot, mostly in Germany. Anyway, so that's that's the reason why we say and jurisdiction, because we spread it throughout. Just, not just in Washington, but in other parts of the world. And that's not true for all Prince Hall Grand Lodge. In fact, I think maybe only a handful, four, five, six states, Prince Hall Grand Lodges have other lodges throughout other, uh, other parts of the world. Washington State have the most. Okay, Washington, we're quite a, we're quite a state. <laughs> not only are we beautiful, <laughs> but we're quite a state. Okay, um, and uh, as we move forward, you'll see another um, good point about Washington State and why I continue to live here. The Prince Hall Grand Lodge uh, uh, and, and constituent lodges have contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars through scholarship and charitable giving. The Grand Temple is in Seattle, Washington, and other properties in Bremerton and Tacoma, because Bremerton is where our naval Bases. Okay. All right. Now we cannot m talk about Prince Hall Masons without mentioning William H. Upton. Okay. William H. Well, at least Prince Hall Masons in Washington State. Let me let me make that clarification. And you see, he was Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Washington, eighteen. 98 to 1899, if you recall, I say uh, uh, Grand Lodge of Washington was established in 1858. Okay, so he was a Grand Lodge. Now, what was his significance to Prince Hall Masons? Now, let, excuse me. Let's, let's speak of uh, who William H. Upton is, the man. He was born William H. Henry Upton, graduated from Yale College, three years in the Navy, at Washington City, you know, that's now Washington, D.C. Used to be Washington City, yes. Uh, and then, um, then he attended Columbia Law School. He arrived in Walla Walla to open his practice. He was elected in the city council in 1887. And in 1890, he was elected to the Superior Court Judge of Walla Walla in Franklin County and Franklin counties, and in 1892 elected as master of the Blue, Lodge, Blue Mountain Lodge in Walla Walla, and in 1898, uh, after serving in other Grand Lodge positions, elected as grand master of the most worshipful Grand Lodge, free and accepted Masons of Washington. Now, his contribution. Now, he made much contribution to, to Freemasonry, especially on his report on black Freemasonry. And, their leg and, and to recognize their leg legitimacy. So in 1897, two Negro Masons residing in the Washington Territory petitioned to be recognized. Uh, the petition was referred to a committee of three that included Thomas A. Reed, Thomas A. E. Edmiston, and William H. Upton. Now, must, now we talked about uh, uh, up there, but let me speak briefly about and why this why this report is is is, is significant. Thomas A. Reed, a Southern man by birth, a Southern man by birth, a charter member of the Grand Lodge and the past Grand Master, and served as Grand Secretary for 40 years. Edmiston, also a Southern man by birth, uh, served in the Confederate Army and chair of the Grand Lodge of Washington Jewish Purity. Jewish Prudence Committee for many years. Okay, we know about Upton. Now, in 1898, they presented their report to, the, to, to their Grand Lodge, expressing that colored Masons, which could trace his descent from the Grand Lodge of English through Prince Hall, was in, in fact, in all respect, legitimate. Now, here we have Southern gentlemen realizing, wait a minute, they are legitimate, looking at black men recognizing that they are legitimate Masons. Now that's significant. 
Okay, a resolution was put forth uh, that same year that was passed uh, to recognize Prince Hall Mason of, this, of, this, of, of Washington State. It was passed. Washington State was the first to recognize Prince Hall Masons. The first. However, <laughs> due to the racial climate of the time, pressure was placed upon them from, from the Grand Lodge of America and they had to withdraw. Okay. So, Upton uh, was so res resolving his commitment that when he died, he said, no monument will be placed at my gravestone until white and black Masons can gather as brothers. And then in 1906, William Upton passed away, not realizing his, what happened. So, although the Grand Lodge of Washington was first recognizing Prince Hall Mason, but due to the racial climate, had to withdraw. It was in 18, uh, 1947 when the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts consequently became the first to have a binding resolution. Now, you remember uh, Massachusetts, that's where the first African Lodge was established. Of course, they want to be first now. They want to be the first to have the, to, to, to have the first African Lodge and the first to, to, bind, to, to recognize them on a, on, on a continuous basis. However, Washington was the first to put forth the resolution, okay? And, and, and it didn't happen for them until 1947. Washington did it in 1898. Okay, go Washington. <laughs> All right, and then in uh, 1990, 91 years after withdrawal of the resolution, the Grand Lodge of Washington passed a resolution, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, of Washington as regular, lawful, and legitimate, and they together pass a res resolution allowing mutual fellowship and visitation. And we still do that today. We were out with them uh, uh, last night with one of the uh, uh, Grand Lodge of, of Washington, uh, or at least the Prince, uh, Grand, yeah, we were out with them last night on a different occasion. <laughs> Anyway, and, and, uh, eight, and then, then in 1999, 1991, 84 years after his passing, the Grand Lodge of Washington and the, and the Prince Hall Grand Lodge were gathered at Mountain View Cemetery Walla Walla to lay a marker at William H. Upton's grave site. We finally did it. Okay? Let me show you what that looks like. I think, oh, there we are. That's his gravestone, the Masonic emblem. And, and there's a sign posted right to it. This remarkable man with, was the first Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Free and Deceptive Masons of Washington State in 1898, who first recognized Prince Hall Masonry, a branch of Freemasonry for African Americans. Now, uh, this is the reverse side. You see the white hand and the hand of color. They made a pen, which I have one together, we could, uh, which I have one, and it's a pen we could put on our collar, and it's a white hand and a black hand grasping one another in unity. That happened 1991. And, and it's, on the back side, it's, it reads, this memorial commemorate the last will and testament of William H. Upton, past Grand Master, free and accepted Mason of Washington, who, des who desired that all Masons, regardless of color, should dwell together as recognized Masonic brothers. This was accomplished in 1990 by action of both Grand Lodges. Dedicated in 1991, AD 5991. That's on the backside, and this is in Walla Walla. And that was a great occasion. We, uh, I was there at that ceremony, so was Hank Shea God, and it was a huge, huge uh, event. It was, and we marched through the town, Walla Walla, people came out with newspaper, we had picnic afterwards, it was a grand event. It was a grand, we had his, his, his descendants there as well, and it, it was a grand event. Now. Let's talk about some famous Prince Hall Masons. Some of these you might recognize. Let me see if I can. Oh, there we go. Uh, let's see. Okay, who's that guy? Shaquille O'Neal. 
Don King, Thurgood Marshall, Margaret Evers, who's that? Duke Ellington, uh, um, um, uh, 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 there, there's uh, Jesse Jackson, there's a few others, Andrew, uh, Andrew Young, okay, who's that? Nat King Cole. Yeah, Daniel Chappie Jane, the first four-star black general of the Air Force. First black four-star general. He just happened to be in the Air Force. Okay. Prince Hall Masons. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover a few more of those. There we go. W.E.B. Du Bois. You know him? Okay. Benjamin Hook. That was the guy I was trying to remember. <laughs> Benjamin Hook. Because it's Jesse Jack. Al Shafton. Still alive today, okay. Other authors? Yes, Alex Haley. How many of you know Alex Dumas, the Three Musketeers? He wrote The Three Musketeers. But he also wrote The Count of Monte Cristo. That's right. The Count of Monte Cristo. All right. Both of those happen to be uh, based on true stories. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Alex Haley. Okay, and then uh, publisher of Ebony and Jet magazine. Okay, now of course they don't publish those in hard copy, but you can get them on, on uh, digital now. Okay, uh, okay, Count Basie, yeah. Jerry Butler, yeah. Nat King Cole. There we go. All right, a few others educators. Uh, uh, I think I mentioned him before, but Booker T. Benjamin Mays, former president of Morehouse College. He had a famous quote. I, I didn't write it there. Now, I, I, I highlighted Harry S. Truman. How about that? Yeah. Prince Hall Mason. Wouldn't it be? Who would have thought it? <laughs> Who would have thunk it, as my granny would have said? <laughs> OK. Louis Doug, uh, Lawrence Douglas Wilder, first black elected governor in, in Virginia. Okay, Andrew Young, we mentioned him before. Other inventors, uh, you see other inventors? First, first, first black to receive a patent. Now, of course, we, we know who invented the bulb, but he had problems, right? Trying to keep it lit. Guess who helped him out? A black man. <laughs> he invented the filament that kept the light going, okay? The letter was mentioned of him, okay? And then, guess what? We stop at this every day. Gerd A. Morgan Sr. invented the traffic light and gas mask. And you stop at it every day. <laughs> Black man, Prince Hall Mason. Okay? All right. On the medical, okay, first American black to to, uh, to head the hospital. We had the uh, uh, first surgeon, sports, Scotty Piss Pippen, you see Sugar Ray Robinson, others I mentioned before. Okay, now that's our Grand Lodge up in Washington. And so we have Reverend Samuel uh, McKinney who, who uh, has a street named after him now. He was, a, he was an activist. He invited Dr. Martin Luther King to come up and march. So part of 19th Street is named after him. Other Masons include um, others. There's a few other names. Thomas Rawl, former running back, Seahawks. OK. Uh, yeah, Norm Rice. In fact, Norm Rice was up there with the, with the, the same day we did the uh, dedication of, of the monument. I have a picture with him by his gravesite with Norm Rice. So Norm Rice up there with his, with his Masonic apron on. A few others. OK. Now, Fred U. Harris Lodge, by Lodge. OK, he was, a, he was the 22nd Grand Master in, in 1952. That's what the Grand Lodge was named after. Uh, the Lodge was organized in eight, uh, 1980, chartered in 1981. Two of his members serve as Grand Master, Julian Harris, who is now deceased, and yours truly. <laughs> and then uh, 
And of course, we engage in youth uh, mentorship and programs, and we sponsor. And our largest community event is the Juneteenth event. Okay, and I said we've been doing this since 1982, actually since 1981, a little era. So, speaking of that, the community is invited. Coming up, all right, free food, free haircut. We ask that you bring a non-perishable food item for the, for the Thurston County Food Bank. Because, you know, if we feed you, we want to feed the rest of the people too, who are unable to, to feed themselves, okay? So be sure and be there, Saturday the 15th. Put it on your calendar. Write it down now. <laughs> OK. Uh, it's also partnered with the Lacey, uh, city of Lacey and the city of Tumwater. And their representative will be out there as well. Other, uh, other famous people are under, uh, in Fred G, Vernon Stoner, who was a former city manager. And, and uh, Virgil Clarkson, who was the former mayor. And we got a senior. Uh, sent a name after him. He was, a, he was in our lot. Prince Hall, uh, uh, Prince Hall Freemason, Isaiah Turner. And of course, Michael Harper, uh, Portland Trail Blazer uh, basketball player. We won't hold that against him. <laughs> but unfortunately, we don't have one either, so what can we say? <laughs> All right. Okay. That's the end of the presentation. Those are my sources. OK. Thank you all for your patience. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. And if you have questions, if you need to contact me, I'm sure we'll be able to arrange that. Thank you all. OK. Oh, we're ready with questions today. OK, um, I'll do here. Oh, OK. We'll do one here and then one here. That was a wonderful present. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm curious about why you would let Harry Truman join. <laughs> well, I wasn't there. <laughs> But, 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 but for all these years, members of the Prince Hall Masons were not allowed to join white Masons groups, but Harry Truman got to join yours. I just am curious about let, the let, dynamics let, of all Let me say this. Prince Hall Masons has never discriminated. We have always admitted white, Hispanics, Asians. We were, the, when we became, because why? Because we, we understood the being discriminated against. So we never, if you, regardless of your color, we, it didn't matter what time it was, you wanted to be a Freemason, we allowed that to happen. How about if you were a woman? You can't be a Freemason if you're a woman, even today. But we do have the Order of Eastern Star, which is an auxiliary group to the, to the Freemasons. OK? That's another historical information. <laughs> I have a cousin who married into the Mormon religion. Ah, uh -huh. And so I've done some studying to try and understand her involvement. And, yes. And that fam part of my family's involvement, because I'm not Mormon. And one of the things that I've learned is that their undergarments have Mason symbols on them. Yes. Have okay. you heard of that? And can you explain that? Well, as far as the Mormon religion, no, I can't, actually. But I do know there are many groups, uh, like the Knights of Columbus, who, who were uh, at one time Masons at one time, but we got this disgruntled, you know, uh, decide to separate and, and, and form their own org organization. So, so that could be, well, of course, a lot of those symbols for Masonic orders are, you know, are universal in use as well. Uh, you have to join, no. <laughs> well, we can get into quite a few of those, but uh, there, yeah, I, I can't get into that with you right now. <laughs> uh, let's say we're an organization, we're, we're not a secret organization, we just say an organization with some secrets. <laughs> just like any other organization, just like the church or anybody else have some, some particular you know, uh, parts that are secret to it within their organization. Okay. Any other questions? 
This is really not a, a question, it's a response. You listed some black inventors. Yes. Some dec decades ago, we were in Washington, D.C., yes. uh, visiting one of the Smithsonian's, and they had a program that evening. Yes. And our young son was is a black man now. He's Good. a black kid then. Mm -hmm. And the title of the presentation was 1,001 Black Inventions. Uh-huh. And there were so many things that we use every day. Absolutely. Potato and chips, the inventors' names else. were never recorded uh, to us as school kids or whatever. Great. But it was a wonderful presentation, and he was not wanting to go until the opening scene when they came out wrapping these inventions. <laughs> All right. That's true. I mean, the, the, the potato chip, what, what most people eat today, was invented by a, a man of color. He wasn't a Prince Hall Mason, so he wasn't up there. <laughs> but yes, but uh, that's another story how he came about inventing the potato chip. And it was by accident. He, he was trying to serve a, 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 a white uh, patron who, and, and who, who didn't like how, how, the, how the chip, uh, how, how the potato was served and set it back. So, so he, out of, out of uh, anger, just, okay, I'm going to fix it like this. And he did it crisp, real crisp. And the patron loved it, and it became the potato chip. <laughs> so, yeah, there are a lot of inventions that are made by uh, men, men of color there. Uh, uh, because you got to understand also, during that time, black men were not allowed to get patents in many occasions, you know. So, you know, there were especially those, and, and there was uh, enslaved people who invented things, but because they couldn't get pa patents, the white slave owners patented and made the money themselves. Yeah. All right, any other question? Any online? Okay, they're gone. All right, thank you. <laughs> Round right. of applause for Lester. Thank you All again right, so thanks. much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very Alrighty. much. It's good. To, uh, thank you for being, for, for me being last. I hope this is memorable for you. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you folks for joining us this evening. Uh, we will see you next History Talk season. Have a good night, everyone.